folks. In the last video lecture, I went over different theories of work, um, ending with the theory of Richard Sennett. In this video lecture, I'm going to continue the exploration of the work of Richard Sennett in relation to contemporary work. And also, uh, as a complement to that, look at the approach to issues of work under capitalism by the contemporary geographer and Marxist David Harvey. I mentioned at the end of the last video lecture that for Senate, one of the key points, uh, one of the key problems of contemporary work is its fluidity. Um, for Senate, there is an inherent human need to create a sense of abiding identity um, and work should ideally be one of the resources, one of the contexts in which uh, social and personal identity is forged. And he thinks because of the uh, patterns of instability and fluidity in contemporary work that uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult to uh, identify oneself socially and individually through what one does. So we're gonna explore initially here uh, the background to Senate's theory and get into some more detail on that. I have called this set of lectures Disposable Work, Disposable Workers to give a sense of the, um, the, the fragility, the insecurity, which according to Senate and Harvey from different perspective, perspectives marks contemporary work in economies such as the United States and the UK and also global. So beginning with Senate's uh, approach to this, and again here, I'm drawing on um, his uh, 2008 lectures, um, which set out what he calls the, the culture of the new capitalism. Um, I'm drawing generally on more recent work from Senate. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, Senate has been uh, publishing and researching in this area since the late 1960s. So the first uh, idea uh, in Senate that I'd like to draw your attention to is <clears throat> what he refers to as the specter of uselessness. Um, this is one of the great challenges, as he sees it, um, of work. And I would note straight away that there's a kinship here with Graeber's idea of bullshit jobs that we looked at uh, at the very beginning of this class. Uh, the idea of a bullshit job is that it's recognized as essentially useless by the worker themselves. So there's an interesting uh, confluence of thinking uh, in this case between Graeber and Senate here. But here's uh, how Senate introduces the idea or the problem of uselessness. He writes, in the following pages, I want to explore how the specter of uselessness relates to the solution of education and formation, a person's Bildung, as the Germans put it. The connection requires some basic questions, or asking some basic questions. What does skill, more comprehensively talent, mean? How does being a talented person translate into economic value? What Sen is getting at here is um, I guess the, the accepted view of how uh, work is dispensed. Um, normally speaking, uh, we would see ourselves as accruing skills, uh, honing talents and so on and so forth, and then bringing them to the marketplace. Uh, one of the things that Sen wants to do as a social thinker is to explore more deeply um, how talents, as it were, show up, how skills show up as economically validated and valuable. Um, and we have to do some philosophical thinking around this rather than simply assuming that any particular subset of talents is intrinsically valuable. Clearly it isn't. Our economy shifts over time. And so uh, what is economically valuable to market at any one time will change accordingly. So Senate, so where that through the history of modern capitalism, workers have been confronted by the prospects of underemployment and unemployment. 
and that formal education training have been and remain proposed solutions to their challenges. In terms of education, never to a greater degree than in the last 20 to 30 years, education more specifically, further education or tertiary education, that is to say, post-secondary education has really been seen as something of a silver bullet in terms of preparing people for the work market. Now, this is quite noteworthy in the sense that um, up until fairly recently, uh, a, a good secondary education was sufficient uh, for an entry level position, um, certainly in, in the professions. Um, whereas that uh, reality and expectation has changed within the last generation or two. So in a sense, never before has formal education uh, appeared so essential to, uh, to a person's work prospects. That's something that also needs to be looked into. Senate writes the following, the skills economy, he says, still leaves behind the majority. More finely or more specifically, the education system turns out large numbers of unemployable educated young people, at least unemployable in the domains for which they have trained. Now, Senate is a social researcher and ethnographer, but he is also, of course, an academic. And what he's alluding to here is um, the following. Uh, in the traditional academy, in the university, in the college, the underlying idea is that uh, someone will undergo some sort of specialized training. Uh, that manifests itself typically in a student selecting a major or a focus for the work that they do uh, over the period that they're at college, uh, typically uh, over a four-year period. Now, um, all of the academic disciplines are highly specialized, and the invitation to the typical college undergraduate is to gain specialized knowledge in a particular branch of academic learning. However, um, and we can see this uh, in, in lots of data, um, relatively few people use that specialized knowledge in what they go on uh, to do in work which immediately raises a, a, a question or sets up a puzzle. Uh, why are university degrees seen as essential to doing jobs uh, when the content of those degrees, the specific knowledge gain, uh, rarely shows up as a necessary uh, thing uh, in order to do the job? There seems to be something of a puzzle here. Um, uh, you could kind of solve it, I guess, or you try to resolve it in one of two ways. You could either say, well, the university degree is some sort of general ticket, a sort of general credential, if you like. Maybe it's showing some other uh, sorts of attributes or skills, uh, the ability to focus, the ability to complete assignments in a timely way, uh, the ability to uh, deal with complex problems and so on and so forth. So you kind of say there are more general skills that are being acquired. Um, uh, that's one way to go about it. Or another uh, potentially uh, more radical or more cynical approach would be just to say that, well, um, what we have here is a, a sort of credentialing race that um, employers uh, can pick and choose who they want. And uh, they're going to choose people who have degrees because that seems more prestigious and maybe uh, brings uh, more kudos to the firm. And that's another possibility. Uh, but in that case, uh, it seems like a, a little bit of a circular logic to it. Um, we're just going to have graduates uh, at the entry level just because we can. Um, and of course, uh, one of the things that's suggested by the line of argument employed by Senate uh, is that this is confusing and potentially demoralizing for the students themselves that they uh, acquire knowledge and skills that then uh, never finds uh, any kind of application or usage in the work market. But certainly this here, there's something to explore. Um, so to sort of summarize that point, uh, Senate's reflecting on the widespread recognition um, that uh, unemployment uh, was, according to uh, early critics, 
um, of capitalism, that unemployment was systemic and inevitable. Um, and Senate wonders whether the idea that education will allow people to escape unemployment is sound for the majority of people. Um, I mean, another thought that goes along with this is that there's been a huge expansion uh, in public education. Um, uh, sorry, in, in, in tertiary or university college level education, uh, again, over the last two or three, uh, last one or two generations, uh, to, to a point where more than half uh, typically of a population, uh, such as the United States or the UK, uh, half of uh, people are, are getting university degrees. Now, uh, that means that there's been a shift. Um, university degrees uh, through most of the 20th century were a fairly exclusive uh, commodity, uh, but in a situation where the majority of individuals have university degrees, then presumably that undermines uh, the marketable value of a degree as such. Now, there's other things that go into the mix here to do with the kind of university or institution that you went to, was it an Ivy League or a, uh, an elite so-called university uh, and so on. And also those things will count uh, um, in terms of the marketability of a degree. Um, but Senate is generally raising a skeptical question as to whether formal education is really uh, the thing that's going to guarantee um, somebody against unemployment or underemployment throughout their lifetime. Um, it doesn't seem uh, sufficient, um, but it's even curious why it should be deemed as necessary. Um, in expanding and elaborating on this idea of uselessness, uh, Senate uh, writes the following. He says, three forces shape the specter of uselessness as a modern threat. The global la labor supply, automation, and the management of aging. Each is not quite what it might at first glance seem. So um, the specter of uselessness then is broken down by Senate into three specific problems or three sub areas, if you will. And he'll explore each one in turn and uh, we'll do that here briefly. So on the issue of globalization, uh, Senate feels that the idea of jobs simply drifting uh, from developed to developing economies due to the low cost of labor is uh, not the entire truth, but really uh, more of a half truth. Um, and to that point, Senate emphasizes the fact that often workers in the global South are better trained and motivated to take work in places um, like call centers. So um, uh, probably a more Marxist uh, or political economy approach to this would see this as simply a question of um, <clears throat> work gravitating towards lower paid workers. Um, that would have to do with cost of living and so forth, or we could bring in some of the Marx, Marxian thought around this. Um, but it's simply capital is chasing uh, cheap labor. Um, it's a bit more to it than that, obviously. Um, capital typically doesn't like labor restrictions in the form of union regulations and so forth. So the ability of a workforce to remove its labor um, on account of its uh, being unionized and so forth, these would be other considerations. And certainly, uh, in the 80s and 90s, when uh, globalization really took off in a big way, um, the uh, anti-union uh, consequences of uh, offshoring uh, of work uh, were certainly to the fore. Um, but Senate's also pointing out the fact that um, uh, for the contemporary um, labor market, um, it may simply be the fact that uh, overseas workers are better skilled. Um, sure, uh, there's a question of cost overall, but it might just be uh, that they bring better skills to the position. Uh, now, Senate's perfectly aware of the fact that um, there's also an animus against uh, uh, foreign workers, uh, sometimes for xenophobic or race racist reasons. Um, that would be uh, more recently, most obviously part of, for example, um, the Republican Trump uh, platform to uh, bring jobs home and so forth. Uh, 
However, um, it's a little bit more difficult to do that when um, there are all uh, when our, essentially our global economy has been has been configured, has been engineered to allow big companies to go wherever they want, essentially uh, to source the workers um, that they most need and find most cost effective. Um, and Senate touches on this here. He says the specter of uselessness intersects here with the fear of foreigners, which beneath its crust of simple ethnic or race prejudice is inflected with the anxiety that foreigners may be better armed for the tasks of survival. That anxiety has a certain basis in reality. Uh, something interesting here that um, certainly this is the case, uh, say in my home country of the UK uh, with the Brexit vote uh, had a similar uh, underlying aspiration to uh, essentially uh, keep jobs for domestic workers and to prevent uh, or to at least curtail the amount of uh, non-British EU citizens that were coming to the UK to take certain jobs. But um, it's noteworthy where those types of jobs are in the economy. Uh, an obvious area that's applicable both to the United States and the UK is agriculture. Um, now, uh, it may simply be the case that, uh, you know, uh, that a certain amount of uh, workers uh, born in America simply wouldn't want to do that work. Um, there are, I believe, an estimated 8 million um, non-documented migrant workers uh, who essentially keep U.S. agriculture going. And similarly, in the U.K., um, um, up until... Uh, the, the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. Um, agriculture was really reliant on seasonal workers coming from Eastern Europe. So um, the, the, the problem here with the bring jobs home uh, rhetoric is, well, would um, American citizens want to do this work anyway? Would British citizens want to do this work anyway? Um, and it seems uh, the question to that uh, the answer to that question is often no, they wouldn't. Um, but also this sense of, curiously, um, Senate feels a sort of fear based on inferiority that actually the foreign workers, as he says, are better armed for the tasks of survival. Um, and so there's a sort of uh, a curious sense here of wanting to, to defend one's privileges whilst knowing uh, that one is not as fit to do this work um, as those that are feared. So just interesting sort of social psychology observation here from Senate. And to elaborate on that point, um, <clears throat> that um, here, the, the current politics of right-wing populism, so most recently uh, under Trump, um, draws certainly uh, some core strength from the idea that globalization isn't working for the early developed eco developing economy. So economies such as the US, um, and this, as I've already mentioned, brings, uh, brings to the fore a rhetoric of bringing the jobs home. Um, but as I've also mentioned, uh, there's been uh, an architecture of the global econ uh, economy put in place uh, over the last 40 years. Um, that uh, make this matter much more complicated. Um, so uh, most obviously uh, under um, international trade organization rules, um, a national government cannot uh, use protectionism to protect its own labor markets. Uh, that's actually illegal under international law. And so there are very severe restrictions imposed on the state. Um, and this is the type of legal uh, economic uh, infrastructure that's been created uh, quite voluntarily by and led by countries like the United States. Um, so you can't just turn the clock back on this type of manufactured world global economy uh, in the space of two or four years. So another aspect of this then, we've just looked at outsourcing and the, mo the movement of labor from um, uh, advanced economies to developing economies. 
Um, now Senate turns his attention to the threat of automation. And certainly uh, there's a lot of attention on the uh, threat of automation in the contemporary debate around work. Senate writes, in the past, the threat of automation was over-dramatized. The problem lay in the design and development of the machines, machines themselves. Um, I think what Senate's getting at here is that this is a, there's a time-honored concern that, as it were, the machines uh, are going to completely uh, replace the human body in the workplace. Um, certainly, if we go back through the history of um, the worker movement, uh, early on, um, uh, a common tactic of workers was machine breaking. So was, there was this sort of rage um, against machines um, because they were seen as replacing uh, the skills of the human body. And of course, uh, you know, in, in the early industrial revolution, uh, the machines could produce way more in certain instances um, than uh, the human body and the human body simply couldn't compete. Um, nevertheless, um, it's not as though from the 1820s on, uh, there was no requirement for human bodies and that requirement has continued uh, through the 20th and into the 21st century. So um, uh, what Senate wants to do here, I think, is point to, to a sort of mass psychology of fear vis-a-vis -vis automation that's been there uh, probably throughout the whole history. Um, of industrial capitalism. Um, so Senate here insists that the true replacement of workers by machines is actually uh, quite a recent phenomenon. Um, part of his reason for thinking that is that, um, you know, prior mechanical uh, automation required human beings to maintain these machines constantly. So uh, you know, the machines didn't, as it were, run themselves. So there was still this need um, for human beings to oversee and to maintain the machinery. But now under our computerized automation, we're maybe getting to this point where the automation is self-regulating uh, such that it would truly reduce out the need uh, for human uh, agency. Senate writes uh, the following. In service labor, automation has converted the science fiction of the past into technological reality. I'm thinking, he says, of intelligent voice answering devices, automation's future threat to the call center, or barcode readers, which have transformed back office accounting, inventory management, and front of counter sales. So um, Senate's message here is that, well, you know, if concerns about automation in the past were overblown, um, perhaps now we're finally at the threshold where those concerns are well merited. And um, of course, the question then becomes, well, where do we go from here? Um, again, we could uh, pick up the threads of Graeber's um, thinking in terms of, well, you know, one way to go with this would be to make uh, to reduce the work week, the average work week, but obviously still make that pay. Um, you couldn't retain, obviously, the current hourly rate of work and simply slash people's work hours to a third of what they currently are, so something in the region of 15 hours a week. Obviously, that wouldn't work. Um, you'd need something else uh, to, to compensate for that. Um, but if the work is being done, then the value of that were by, primarily by automated machines, computer-based automation, um, then the key uh, problem to be solved is uh, how to distribute the value of that work, which is now being done purely um, by machines and not by human beings. So Senna's point here is that it's only in the last 20 years that automation has actually begun to replace jobs that were done by people and that this is particularly true in the service sector. We might here bring back into play, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Graeber's thesis that our economy has spawned many bullshit jobs in the middle management area, perhaps as a way to balance automation. So again, uh, coming back to Graeber's idea, um, that there's this curious sense in which, well, even if we 
don't need the humans to do the work. We're just going to keep them busy um, because the social and political threat of having people have most of their time to themselves, re drastically reducing the work week, is too great uh, a risk to the status quo. So, you know, Graeber would step in and offer an explanation here as to why there are there's so much seeming um, uh, unproductive work in the 21st century economy. So the third uh, challenge that uh, uh, relates to uselessness, as Senate sees it, is aging. Uh, I think Senate's particularly sensitive to this point. Um, and I think it's one that uh, he's right to draw attention to and does deserve more attention in our discussions around the politics of work. Senate writes the following, he says, the cutting edge organization indeed tends to treat older employees set in their ways, slow, losing energy. In advertising and media, the prejudice against age combines with views of gender. Middle-aged women are particularly stigmatized as lacking drive. This combined prejudice appears also in financial services. So um, the notion here um, is that um, as our economy favors and, and puts in the balance more and more innovation, um, then the more effectively ageist it becomes, the idea being that only young people uh, can have truly innovative ideas. And also, as he adds in, there's a sort of gender bias um, that somehow the uh, innovative, energetic young male is really the paradigmatic uh, employee in this context. Um, and Senate here is addressing aging both as a question of social perception and as a matter of economic realities. Here, it, uh, it's the prejudice of ageism compounded by gender-based gender bias that is noted. Um, by the economic realities, um, uh, I mean, in this case, that older employees, generally speaking, command a higher wage. Um, and uh, this is one of the motivations for wanting to hire younger people. Uh, another, uh, as Senate elaborates on, is that um, because older employees have more experience, uh, they won't put up with a lot of things. They, they've seen certain things and they have certain expectations based on their experience. A young or new employee is a sort of blank slate. And to some extent, they'll accept whatever comes their way. If for no better reason, they have nothing other to compare it to. And he adds also the following uh, in this quote, age more directly touches the question of talent if we think about how long a skill lasts. If you're an engineer, how long will the skills you learned in university serve you? Less and less. Skills extension has sped up, not only in technical work, but in medicine, law, and various crafts. So this is another part of the instability and the fluidity of work, as far as Senate is concerned, is that whereas, you know, as the workplace changes through the impacts of technology more and more rapidly, then obviously skill sets become outdated, become obsolete more and more quickly. And this is also the case even in the very highest professions as they're traditionally seen um, in, uh, you know, of, of a doctor or a lawyer and so forth. Um, so uh, this adds in the question of, um, you know, the obsolescence of an employee's knowledge. Um, and there will be a sense at which uh, that there's a point in somebody's uh, career trajectory where it's going to be increasingly difficult for them to acquire the new skills and new knowledge necessary to, uh, to be a cutting edge employee. Um, so um, <clears throat> bringing some of this together, we can say that when workers are expected to invest in themselves, their acquired skills uh, have a given shelf life that varies between professions and sectors. And again, this kind of circles back to the idea of getting credentials, going to universities and so on and so forth. Um, if the idea is that you go to university as a one-off self-investment, uh, you know, which many people carry around as a debt for decades to come, that might, not be that might not be necessary to get you through more than a decade or two 
and then you will no doubt have to return to university to get the newest uh, knowledge and skills and there's sort of an iterative process here. Um, but often, more often than not, the financial burden of reskilling falls on the employee themselves and not so much on the employer. So uh, expanding on this, um, uh, Senate identifies a devaluing of age and even of experience in work. And he writes the following. Just because flexible firms expect employees to move around, and just because these firms do not reward service and longevity, the employer's choice is clear. The younger person is both cheaper and less trouble. The many firms which do invest in the skills of their employees over the long term tend to more traditional kinds of organization. But what Senate's getting at here is uh, arguably a key factor of uh, work in the age of neoliberalism. Um, whereby uh, skilling oneself for a job, reskilling oneself for a changing workplace, almost all of the uh, responsibility for that falls on the individual themselves, on the employee. Now, there are different uh, uh, um, systems in place in different parts of the world. Germany uh, is, 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 a, is a key example, as is Japan, where uh, companies take seriously apprenticeships and actually actually training up their own people uh, in a kind of reciprocal agreement uh, that, you know, I'm going to invest in you as an employee and, and you're going to, you know, spend five years, it's almost like the military in a way, uh, as it operates here in the US, uh, you'll have a certain period in which you are effectively tied to that company because of the investment that they've made in you. Um, and that takes, well, whilst that might seem restrictive uh, to some degree, um, obviously those are ultimately transferable skills and those can be taken elsewhere, um, but they give, uh, they shift the balance of responsibility and uh, make clear um, that there's a reciprocal um, relationship of responsibility between the employer and the employee. So as Senate sees that the shift over the last 40 years has been towards employer-employee flexibilization. That is, that the company has little incentive to retain and retain, retrain the worker um, uh, who is encouraged to keep moving on to new jobs. Um, so, as I mentioned uh, in the previous uh, video lecture, there's a kind of reciprocal breaking of loyalty ties. Um, so the employer uh, doesn't feel that they're uh, bound to protect and nurture the employee, but the employee reciprocally doesn't feel any loyalty to, 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 to the company. And whilst uh, this is generally portrayed as an emancipating and emancipatory thing, um, I think Senate is all too aware um, that actually this brings lots of downsides to it in terms of instability, insecurity, um, and a sense that the employer and the employee is always scrambling to find new work and having to hustle. Um, so, um, Senate somewhat sort of bringing together this, uh, this picture of contemporary work writes the following. In those firms which do abandon the structures of social capitalism, social capitalism is the form of capitalism in a sense that predated neoliberal capitalism, whereby there's this stronger reciprocal bond between employer and employee. Uh, in those firms who, which do abandon the structures of social capitalism, the personal consequence of focusing on young talent is that as experience increases, it has less value. I found in my interviewing that this slighting of experience was notably strong among consultants who have a professional interest in thinking so. Their work in changing institutions requires suspicion of long entrenched employees whose accumulated institutional knowledge appears a barrier to swift change. Um, in some ways, uh, Senate reserves his greatest scorn for the consultant. That is to say, um, usually uh, outside consultants that are brought in to a company to suggest restructuring uh, for productivity or rationalization uh, uh, purposes. And as he's pointing out here, it's the sort of the older employees, the ones who are perhaps worked at a particular firm uh, for two or three decades that are uh, very often seen as stumbling blocks for the kind of reforms that the, con the consultants might want to bring into play. And the paradox here, I think, for Senate is that, well, you know, 
uh, in the past under social capitalism, as he calls it, these employees would have been seen uh, uh, as all the more valuable because they have a longevity, they have a memory of the way the organization has worked over a long time. But instead of that, they're seen as sort of stuck in old modes of thinking and doing, uh, and therefore essentially as a problem, as a thorn in the side for of innovative entrepreneurial ideas. So in many ways, the professional the consultant typifies uh, for Senate the culture of the new capitalism. That is to say, uh, as someone who comes in from the outside, from outside a company to review its health and capacity for structural change. And the ruling idea here is that some outside shock is needed to jolt a business out of complacency and overcome institutional inertia. So there's a kind of, there's a kind of two level um, construction here of a healthy company. One is um, to do with who brings about the change. So the idea is that, you know, a company left to its own purposes will just drift into inertia and will become unsuccessful, unproductive, unprofitable. Um, so you have to have some, somebody come out, come from the outside, uh, view the company differently and shake things up. And together with that uh, goes a certain uh, val valorization of a certain type of CEO who also operates in that way. And uh, as the phrase goes, moves quickly and breaks things. Um, so the idea that you, know, you come in, you shake things up. Uh, of course, you don't win yourself many friends in doing that, um, but it's necessary for the company. But you, but you have to also remember that the consultants themselves um, don't have any loyalty to the company or to the employees. Um, and I think for Senate, there's certainly a punitive function here to the way companies are restructured uh, and particularly punitive in relation to the older employees. And that's the key point that he wants to bring into play here. So um, uh, a further point that Senate raises here is an anticipation of his next book, uh, which is simply called The Craftsman. Um, uh, and um, in The Craftsman, um, Senate champions uh, craftsmanship, unsurprisingly, um, as a kind of antidote to contemporary work. Um, and uh, you know, the idea of craft, you're probably going to think of, um, you know, using your hands in a skilled way, you know, metal work, jewelry making, carpentry, this type of thing. Um, Senate has a very broad appreciation of craft, uh, which certainly includes things like teaching. Uh, and even at one point, uh, he refers to parenting as a kind of craft. Anything that is done over the long term involves a certain sort of self-regulation through trial and error, and involves uh, the development of skills that are inherent to the worker themselves um, can uh, carry the label craft. And he has his own uh, definition uh, here, which is often in this quote. He writes, an embracing definition of craftsmanship would be doing something well for its own sake. Self-discipline and self-criticism a deer in all domains of craftsmanship, standards matter, and the pursuit of quality ideally becomes an end in itself. One of the things that worries Senate about contemporary work is that craft is simply not rewarded, um, that really it's simply the rapidity of, uh, as it were, um, getting stuff done rather than doing it well for its own sake, uh, which is his definition of, of work as craft. Um, but as we'll also see uh, in, in this lecture and future lectures, um, Senate is also acutely aware of the psychological benefits of craft, of the level of satisfaction that a worker gets from doing a job well. But in order to do a job well in a workplace, you need to be given sufficient time to do it well. And uh, all too often in contemporary work, that time is not available. Um, this idea of self-discipline and self-criticism is also important. We can contrast that with the consultant's model that we just considered, where the consultants are essentially an external um, measures um, of the value and viability of a company. Uh, craft is, involves acquiring an internal critical mechanism 
by which you can determine whether you're good or otherwise it's something so the craftsman as he sees it is largely self-regulating of course they look at other practitioners and they use that themselves and that's also important the the sort of a person-to-person -person network which craft requires um, but as soon as someone is skilled in a craft and they're largely self-regulating and that's important to some so um, in some Senate puts forward craftsmanship as a kind of antidote to the trends, the trend of skill erosion that characterizes the contemporary capitalist economy. Um, craft is something that you keep, you retain it. It stays with you, it goes with you. Think of craft as, you know, being able to um, play an instrument or whatever, right? Um, you have to keep your hand in, but it doesn't, it's not easily lost. Um, and here, Senate again goes back to the um, idea that, you know, someone that dedicates himself to work as a kind of craft uh, is not even seen neutrally, but actually seen largely as a kind of threat, uh, given the culture of the new capitalism. He writes, the management code word here is ingrown. Someone who digs deep into an activity just to get it right can seem to others ingrown in the sense of fixated on that one thing. An obsession is indeed necessary for the craftsman. He or she stands at, at the opposite pole from the consultant who swoops in and out, but never nests. Um, so uh, the idea here is that you dedicate yourself to something. And I think Senate's also, uh, even if he doesn't mention it as such, uh, is I think reaching for a, a kind of older idea of a job as a vocation, something you're dedicated to over time, something that is well suited to you and again something that gives you a sense of self which senate is is feels very strongly is um really hard to come by in the contemporary job market so those who practice craftsmanship are often seen essentially as obsessive nerds who insist on the detail of doing a job right and this once again stands in opposition to the imperative never to get attached too attached to a job uh, or to the skills that one possesses. So as Senate, uh, as, as we looked, uh, as we saw in an earlier quote of Senate in the previous uh, video lecture, um, as, as he sees it, one of the imperatives in the contemporary job market is to wanna basically uh, not to hold on to the past. Um, and, and Senate sees this as difficult to the point of agonizing. Um, a worker typically wants to think of themselves as accruing more skill over time, more dignity uh, and more capacity. But increasingly, as he sees it, contemporary, the contemporary job market erases the past and invites the worker to forget their past and to just keep on reinventing themselves. So um, uh, a further point here relates to a critique of meritocracy. Uh, and again, what Senate's trying to work out here is the logic that's used in the contemporary job market um, for who advances uh, and who doesn't. And merit, you know, the idea of being a, uh, something being meritocratic uh, seems an innocuous enough idea at first glance that, well, you know, the, the, the jobs will go to those who are most talented, who possess the most merit. But uh, Senate sees a kind of curious game going on behind the rhetoric of merit, uh, as the following quotes make clear. He writes, within the meritocratic scheme, scheme, there is a soft center in evaluating talent. That soft center concerns talent conceived in a particular form as potential ability. In work terms, a person's human potential consists in how capable he or she is uh, in moving from problem to problem, subject to subject. The ability to move around in this way resembles the work of consultants writ large, but potential ability cuts a, lar cuts a larger cultural swathe. It is a damaging measure of talent. Um, uh, what he means by this, I try to expand on in the next uh, bullet point, um, so that as opposed to craftsmanship where the value lies in the quality of the object made, Senate views merit as a largely subjective measure of worth, um, particularly when it comes to potential ability. Um, 
the, the those who can do a craft, as it were, uh, are exhibiting skills due to past practice. So the worker viewed through the lens of craft is viewed through the lens of their past activity. Um, in stark opposition to this, the idea of potential uh, uh, of someone having percent potential is a kind of open and loose idea of what someone might do in the future. Um, but Senate suspects um, that the appeal to potential is really just a way of denigrating uh, those workers who have already acquired skill. Um, and he goes on, he has more to say about this idea of potential. Uh, and this is in the third bullet point. He writes, judgments about potential ability are much more personal in character than judgments of achievement. An achievement of comp compound social and economic circumstances, fortune and chance with self, whereas potential ability focuses only on the self. The statement you lack potential is much more devastating than you messed up. It makes a more fundamental claim about who you are. It conveys uselessness in a more profound sense. So the potential in question is really, I think for Senate, down to uh, a disposition that the worker has to be open to changing their skills and their expectations about work. Um, so really, I think um, uh, part of this is uh, all about the, the, the power dynamic between the worker and uh, the employer. Um, the, the more unspecified, in a sense, the potential is, the more power um, an em employer has to um, take on a worker or to promote that worker. Um, and again, the more, in a sense, uh, alienating um, the, the, the process through work becomes. Uh, whereas craft, again, uh, I think Senate feels that someone who possesses a, a craft skill uh, is someone who has, in, who has a certainty about what they can do. Whereas those who are being engaged by it's on potential merit uh, really don't necessarily know what it is that they have potential uh, in or to do. Um, and the final point here is that Senate argues that measuring a person's worth through merit, understood as potential, tends to label many as useless and so unworthy of respect and recognition. It's stigmatizing rather than socially liberating. So the idea here is that those who possess, who possess merit or in the terms of potential uh, are few and far between. And as I said, the, the more vague in a sense that potential is, uh, the more it works to, to denigrate and demoralize workers because people don't really know what it is, uh, what this potential is that they're meant to display. Um, uh, and it seems to trump any kind of gained ability or skill that a worker has already acquired. So um, I'm going to transition after this to uh, the work on uh, from David Harvey, who, as we'll see, has a complementary uh, but nevertheless distinct uh, approach to the problems that Senate considers. <clears throat> 